Joss Whedon's favorite charities, and also make some art and uh, continue on the, the Firefly franchise. Uh, he, we were talking with Mr. Michael Doherty, uh, the, the director producer of uh, Brown Coats Redemption. Uh, Mike, welcome back. It's good to have you again. Uh, it's good to be back. How are you guys doing? Oh, great. we're great. Great. You know, we, we've had you on this. You're probably one of the most reoccurring people that have on the <laughs> podcast because we had you on back. Oh, at the very beginning of Brown Coast Redemption, then we hit you up at Farpoint this past year, and, and now you're back ha- having Brown Coast Redemption kind of behind you in a sense. Um, yes. With, Brown, with, I guess, Dragon Con being kind of the final last hurrah with some discs shipped out slightly afterwards? Yeah, that, that was uh, about it. Um, we, uh, we ended the project strong, man. I'm, I was really, really shocked. One of the big things that... Um, so we started this back in 2008 with uh, me and a gentleman by the name of Stephen Fisher, who I think you've met at Farpoint once or twice. I think so. Um, so uh, he's like, have you ever thought about doing a Firefly fan film? And, you know, history kind of proves that we said yes and uh, made a charity model doing. We did something that nobody's ever done before, which is we've got studio permission and creator permission to make a fan film and actually use that to raise money for charity. Um which is, is kind of huge, because, I mean, normally studios, if you make any money whatsoever, will shut you down. You'll get a nice cease and desist letter. You'll get, like, some kind of slap on the wrist. Uh, there'll be a nice fine. So, so, nor- nice meet- so normally when they do that, all, normally when people make fan films, they, they just put it out there, don't earn, earn any money off it, and that's it. Correct. Yeah. Um, and, and so far, most studios, like, Lucas has a really good policy. He's like, make as much as you want. He'll give you some, like, stock music and stock file effects and things like that. He's like, but the minute you may, uh, like break any part of my agreement, I'm bringing the hammer down on you. Hmm. Um, Paramount's got a really kind of strong yet blind eye to Star Trek fan films. They're of the same mind as long as you're not making a profit. It's, it's kind of one of those art forms that as long as you're not making any money, they don't care how much you sink into it. Um, because ultimately it just continues to help their brand. But I, I don't know what we did to get lucky, but Fox happened to say, you know what, your business model looks tight. Um, as long as you dot your I's and cross your T's and we can check your books whenever we want, go have fun. Um, and I don't think anybody expected in 2008 that we get to where we are today, which is raising over $112,000 in the course of one year. That's awesome. Uh, that's just for the charity. That's not even cost, uh, like the movie paid for itself. Uh, the movie cost like forty thousand dollars to make. It cost about like thirty thousand dollars in legal fees. Uh, it cost us twelve thousand dollars to produce all of the DVDs and Blu-rays that people get. Um, so I mean, you're you're looking at almost a uh, ninety thousand dollar production budget, including marketing, wow. and the, not a, yeah. So the movie paid for itself plus one hundred and twelve, so almost a quarter of a million dollars. That's awesome for yeah. a fan film. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's epically huge, and I mean it's it's changed the course of my life because in 2008 I'd never made a movie before. Like I helped friends out when I'm like, I get a little fan film or something you want to help with. I'll hold a, a pole or a light or whatever, but I never directed, never wrote, uh, and now I've got the bug, and so I'm happy to say that Brown Coach Redemption has shipped to every continent on the globe. We've kind of gotten it out to places that when I first started, I was like, wow, this would be really cool if it played in California. Um, it's now in Antarctica and Tokyo and New Zealand and all these different places I've never visited in my life. Um, and that's mainly because of the Brown Coat community, which is like an awesome group of people. So I, you said something that made me just uh, wonder, how did you even get involved other than the invitation that you got for Brown Coast Redemption, how did you get into helping with fan films at all? Um, I, I just kind of helped out. Like you have friends in the area that always want to make a movie or something, whether it's a fan film or they're they're trying to do a short or something like that. I I just kind of was like one of those guys. It's like, well, if you need me to hold something, I will. I, I was more happy to be one of those armchair quarterbacks or armchair directors. Like you know, to go to the movie theater and you can. You know, you have no film experience, but you're going to tell everything of what was wrong in the movie and how you would have done it better. Right. Um, and I kind of got, like, that bitter taste in my mouth of fandom of, like, I'm tired of complaining that I want more Firefly, and I'm tired of waiting for more Firefly. And it was just that, plus Steve asking the right question at the right time, was just really me going, okay, look, if I want to do this, I have a story to tell, and I don't think anybody, 
but me can tell the story that's in my head. So let me just do this and, and see if we could get it done. Um, and of course, being completely naive, and I, I'm much better where I am now than I was before, but I didn't know what I didn't know. So I first, my first thought is, yeah, my first movie is going to be a feature-length film. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in hindsight, I want to kick me in 2008's nuts yeah. because of the amount of work. But like right about now, I'm I'm looking at an original project that uh, would have never seen the light of day if it wasn't for Brown Coats Redemption and everything that I learned from that. And yeah. I, I'm just uh, I'm just completely shocked and awed by the the community that made this what it is and that are willing to say, you know, you guys did such an awesome job. Let's see what you do, even if it's not Firefly. So what have you? Um, what do you? What do you? What are you taking? Um, what are you taking from the experience of making uh, Brown Coats Redemption? Uh, I mean, uh, a couple of big life lessons, man. I mean, it's uh, rule number one is you never know what you're going to get unless you ask. Um, so often in life, I see people just like stop short of awesomeness or greatness because they're afraid to go to. Um, Edward James almost and ask for a podcast interview, you know, or it could be something like that, or it could be just, I have a movie I want to make. And they stop because all the, the doubt in their heads tells them people are going to tell them no. And I can be honest with you and say that we've gotten so many opportunities that I would have never thought possible just because I asked. Um, we almost had an opportunity to do a Brown Coast Redemption prequel comic with Dark Horse Comics. And that got up until the point that Dark Horse was like, as long as you get Fox's permission. And Fox said, well, you're going to make money on that, so no. Um, we got Greg Edmondson, who did the score of the TV show, to do an original track for the film. And, you know, Adam Baldwin and all of those guys volunteered their time. And just because we asked, and, and because they love Firefly, and they could see that our intentions were good. Um, I, I would definitely take away... Another side of this is just, you know, if you're looking to make a film or if you're looking to do something, like, believe in your team. I mean, I'm only as good as the people that helped me make this. And it's it's me on this podcast right now, but I'm, I'm representing over 120 people that volunteered their time and thousands of people that donated money to make this what it was. Um, you know, I, I've seen a lot of people get projects killed because of ego, or the project could have done something so much better than it was, but they got really arrogant and for me I don't ever want to get that guy and you guys got full permission if I become that guy like in five years where I'm just like I don't talk to you don't talk to me you're like uh, we've got you in recording dickhead saying <laughs> <laughs> this is this is your past self talking <laughs> be like um, yes uh, Mr. Michael Doherty in the future this is Michael Doherty in the past these guys get a free nut shot if you become a dickhead <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's one way to keep you honest yeah. <laughs> yeah and it's on record now so there we go it is um, but no I mean it's seriously it's I am I am at a point now where it doesn't make sense to me to start not living my passions like if there's something I want to do I'm like okay how can I tell myself and talk myself out of it? I mean, I created something out of thin air that's now distributed globally that's raised $100,000 plus for charity. Like, me coming up with a comic book and, and talking myself at down from it is just a ridiculous sounding idea. Like, I've painted myself in such a corner now that I can only keep moving forward, and that's the best place to be. And I, I'm really glad that I don't know what I don't know because it allows me so much more creativity with the opportunities to go, oh, you know, if I'd have known that, I wouldn't have done it this way, but I did it this way, which means I did a feature-length film instead of a short because that's what everybody else does. So Yeah. Well, you know, I, I had to think as I was reading, I was following you on Twitter and uh, and following the updates for Brown Coast Redemption and, <laughs> and, and I had to think as Dragon Con rolled around and you sent out those last DVDs. That there had to be, in a sense, um, not in a bad way, but just a sense of a, of a weight lifting off your shoulders. Because you know, for three years, you've been so entwined in this project. You've been so invested in it. It's consumed so much of your time and sleep and rest. And you've been to con after con to kind of build and promote this thing, which has put you in contact with a lot of good people. But at the same time, that has to be extremely tiring at times. And, and I, I just felt that as I watched this kind of come to an end, I was grateful for the experience of it, but I just kind of felt, wow, this must feel really nice to have it at an end as well. Um, 
<laughs> my wife will tell you yes. She is. She, I I've made a promise that I would take uh, two weeks off of, of no film promoting or or anything like that. Which is why, like you you see me on social media, and I'm not really. I, I might say something on the sly of like, "Ooh, look what we have," but you know, it's really kept quiet. And I'm taking two weeks to kind of mentally reconnect with a bunch of people that. Like as you saw, like I would go to two conventions a month since two thousand nine. You know, I would travel back and I lost count how many times I went from Baltimore to Seattle or Baltimore to California and then all over everywhere in between. Um I'm at the point now that I don't know what normal feels like, so I'm trying to figure <laughs> that out again. So it's it's become accustomed to me to be like, All right, it's September, I should be shit, I've got nowhere to go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so just kind of reconnecting and, and, uh, I, I feel weird, man. I'm in that place where I want to do more and I want to work and I'm, I'm like, I've gotten so used to that lifestyle because like you said, it's three years of the grind and keep going and then it does wear you down and you do get tired, but then you go to a convention and you talk to some fans that are like, wow, thank you so much for doing this. Like you've inspired me. I got emails that I've just kind of started to print out and keep in case I start getting like you know, Debbie Downer or whatever, where people are like, you've inspired me to do whatever it is that I wanted to do with my life. And I'm like, okay, now I need to go to Seattle because I want to, I want, that becomes a drug. You like, you want more of that. You want to be able to go, you know, and hear what this movie has done for people that you've never met. And I get to be the jerk that I don't tell them that I'm Michael Doherty, writer and director. I just tell them that I'm the guy here to promote the movie. And then they get to be really honest with me. And then I get scared the shit out of them because I'm like, I'm Michael Doherty, the guy that wrote the movie. And they're like, oh my God. <laughs> um, which is, it's a blessing and a curse because you get people that are really brutally honest and will rip your shit apart. Um, and if you need me to stop cussing, you can just tell me. <laughs> oh, it's not too bad yet. <laughs> cool. But <laughs> <laughs> It's a fine line. Right. Um, but it's like, they'll just be honest for the sake of like, you know, they have an opportunity to tell you what they think and I put myself out there to listen. So... Uh, unlike most people, I'm not going to shy away from it because I want to improve. I want to keep going. But uh, the the wear of continuously going for three years straight, and now that I've stopped, um, yeah, I'm a little bit glad that I stopped because I've started to get worried about myself physically. Right. But creatively, I'm like, I feel like I just slammed the brakes on a car going 120 miles an hour. You know, it's very good. It's good to hear you say that. You know, you took the criticism in stride and just said, "You know what? This is this is a learning experience for me. It's the first film I've done, and I'm you know, I, I you know, you know, it would be ludicrous to think that anyone directing their first film did everything absolutely right 100 percent of the time. And so, why not learn from it? That makes sense, Mike. Yeah, I mean, it's it's honestly. I mean, I'll be honest, dude. I've met so many guys that have made movies or pilots or whatever it is over the past couple of years where it's like, you know, they, they feel like their first movie is so perfect. I'm like, you you have no idea. <laughs> like, when you get to your next movie, it's going to be so different. Like, I, I recognize that I am completely lucky because of Firefly to get the things that I got. That if this was just some random space movie that I created that had no connection to any kind of fandom, I sincerely, well, I know I would hustle just as hard as I had to promote it, but, you know, Firefly is really what made this what it was. Right. Um, but then you get guys that, you know, they barely do 50% of what we did in sales with a, with their movie, and they're talking like their head is huge, and they're, they're waiting for their Spielberg check. Mm. And I'm just... I'm just getting started. You know, I'm looking at, I want a career in this. I don't want to burn bridges. I mean, I'm really fortunate that people like you guys see the work ethic that we put into it. And people like, you know, Greg Edmondson and the charities that we're working for see that, you know, we're busting our butts to the point that the charities are like, all right, dude, slow down. We're a little worried about you. <laughs> um, you know, we like the money, but we, we like to work with you in the future. And not worry about standing over your grave and be like, hey, it would have been great. Yeah. Right. Um, but now, now Derry asked this question. You can opt ahead. not to answer it if you don't want to. It'll be the last thing we talk about, I guess, regarding Brown Coats Redemption. Uh, you what guys were, can't ask me anything. What, what was that? You can't ask me anything. Okay. Right? Well, what you know, you said you said you learned from it. What were some of the things that people said? Well, this wasn't a real strength of the film. Hey, what were what were the areas that that you were hearing that 
that <laughs> in retrospect you would have revisited? Uh, I would have. We didn't have a storyboard for this movie um, because we were supposed to, and the guy that did it kind of backed out at the last minute, like days before we filmed. Um, I would. That would have definitely helped tighten up a lot of shots, t- tighten up a lot of the schedule, which means we would have been freer to shoot more. Um, so there's some performances that I wish I could go back and redo uh, from both lighting and audio and all the other fun stuff. And audio is a big key for us. Um, we, we did a remastered version and we cleaned it up as best as we possibly could. But again, this was like not knowing what we didn't know. Um, so, I mean, I, all the things that I, I knew were weak areas are, are areas that are getting corrected in the next movie. Um, I would have definitely spent a little bit more time on character development in the story, um, recognizing that if you're going to ask somebody to sit down for 90 minutes, that yes, they want a good story, but they also want to be reminded every 20 minutes they're not sitting on their ass. So throw some action in there. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's just little nitpicky things that it's like, I love my movie, but there's so many things that I go back that I'm like, if, if I'd have known what I know then, what I know now, I would have... Uh, this is spoiler alert for anybody that hasn't seen the movie, but I would have taken clips of the beginning of the fight scene at the end and, and just shown like Laura getting her butt kicked. So like, you know, you see her get punched and then the screen goes black and you hear her breathing and then you see another punch. So all you see is like an Alliance guard beating her up. And then the next thing you see is 24 hours earlier and start the movie that way. So instead of just kind of starting quiet and going into it, cause it would have just built a little bit more tension. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, I it's the 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 basic mechanics of audio, you know, basic mechanics of of better lighting, uh, some better screen, you know, shot composition, and then just a little bit of better, you know, storyboard planning. Because I could have played the movie with the uh, the audio track from the table read that we did and pieced that together with the storyboards and known ahead of time certain things weren't going to jive as well. Mm. Well, so you know, I know it's like film school 101 on this. So. Right, right. Well, you know, I just want to I just want to say thank you for bringing, you know, Matt, no matter in, even in spite of those things. Uh we got a chance to to play in this the Firefly universe again, something that we weren't able to do, you know, at when Firefly and Serenity were off the air and off and out of the theaters. And uh and we had fresh material to play with and so uh thank you Mike for bringing that in spite of its flaws bringing it back to the screen for us. Thank you, man. So, that really that really means a lot. And yeah, I, like, no, I, I appreciate it, and I do own it on Blu-ray, and, and I love it. So, And I hope you enjoyed the, the bonus disc of the score. Oh, yes. That was, uh, that was, there's only one time through this entire project that I've kind of given the finger to Fox, um, because they've been really awesome to us, is that we went back to them with a couple different items that said, look, we... Would, we're getting asked to do a copy of the score. We have a bunch of brown coats that have donated music to do a music inspired by CD. Um, we'd really like to open these up to for more charity options. And they basically said, no, you, you get the movies and that's it. And I'm like, okay, well, can we have as many bonus features as we want on the movies? And they said, yeah, sure. I'm like, great, thanks. And I hung <laughs> up the phone. So then the, the score was like, okay, look, you, you won't let me do it by itself, but here's a bonus disc. Um, so you guys get to hear the the Greg Edmondson track in its entirety without anything over top of it. You get to hear some tracks that we we dropped and, and left out or changed. Like you get to like Carl Hayes's original version of the Laura Confession track is really strong. Um, Greg's is awesome, but then you get to hear like the stuff from the trailers and the stuff that we cut out, and then the Marion Call song, which just makes me cry every time I see it or hear it. Because I normally watch it with the credits, which is why I'm crying. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, I mean, thank thank you guys. I mean, if anything else, I hope if you liked it and this inspires you to write your own Firefly fanfic or fanfic of any genre or go out and do your own movie, thank you. Let me know. If this was so terrible and astronomically bad that it inspires you to want to show me how to do it better, please do. And I will donate for a copy of your movie. But I just really want to thank you guys for being a cop podcast that lets us come on and talk and, and thank anybody that's listening that's picked up a copy for uh, just supporting something that everybody from day one was told it was impossible. Yeah, very good. Well, you've done the impossible, right? <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> well, now, but you are done. So part of the reason we're on, not is to wrap that up, but to talk about what's in the future 
from, for, for Michael Doherty and for Big Damn Films? Yeah, so... Tell us um, <laughs> A lot, man. We've... Uh, I, I looked at this, and we did this business model that is kind of unique for entertainment purposes. It's normally something that's tied to, like, opera or documentaries, where you basically have a movie and all the proceeds go to charity. Um, I've kind of resolved myself that if we could take and pay back the movie, plus make well over what would be considered a profit um, on a piece of entertainment and and do good with it, that we're going to continue to do that. We're going to do it with original content. So our next film coming out is a completely original piece. It's going to have tons of nods to Firefly because that's where we came from. Um, But we're doing some amazing things because of the connections that we had which is uh, we've asked Greg Edmondson to come back and score the origin, the whole film. And he's as long as his schedule permits and, and time is willing, he will do. Um, we have an Emmy Award winning uh, audio engineer who is Tamara Johnson, who has worked from everything from the uh, Max Hedrum TV show all the way up to the Modern Family TV show that's on now. She was just recently scoring something um, with Bear from Battlestar Galactica. Okay. Uh, so we, we're taking an opportunity at the people that were awesome and going, hey, you know, we want to help to use them in the area that, you know, we needed the most help. I mean, she is going to provide studio quality music. And I know I'm kind of, you know, dodging the question a little bit, but um, what's next is, is kind of huge. It's if I could do 120 volunteers in a movie, I want to do about a thousand people in this next one. And the next one's a zombie flick. Uh, basic Hollywood pitch is it's Goonies meets Shaun of the Dead in a comic book convention. Okay. Uh, so essentially these four kids are, are, you know, they have their podcast, they're trying to get it off the ground, they're trying to do interviews, and they're stuck in a in something like Baltimore Comic Con or uh, Wizard World Comic Con for the outbreak of a zombie apocalypse and they flip the script and end up documenting it from the inside out. And then all the fun that goes along with that. So it's, it's going to be a bit of horror, a bit more comedy. And then just part of the thing that I really want to do is kind of to get back to a storytelling of empowering teenagers. Cause I remember when I saw Goonies and I saw monster squad, I immediately wanted to go find buried treasure and fight vampires. Hmm. Um, okay. And do that as well. You know, Awesome. So, does this project have a name yet? Uh, it does. The working title is Zcon. Zcon for so, ZombieCon. Oh, ZombieCon. So it's like. So is this like? So just so we get this straight, it's like you're at a regular con and zombies break out. That's yeah, I mean it's it's exactly. And the the idea is like honestly, how long would it take for us to realize there are actual zombies at a comic convention? Yeah. Probably yeah. Take, it'll probably take a little while. We would probably just think that... Um, oh, look, they're some, acting. Some, some really good makeup, really good <laughs> costumes. Yeah. It's, exactly. It's like a lot of people ignore it until the real, real gore starts. And then the immediate panic of like a thousand people in the same room trying to, to get out. Hmm. And then you have zombies just... It's like zombie smorgasbord. And then the other side of it is just from a visual aspect is you get to see all of these cosplay people turn into zombies. You know, like, I just think that would be amazingly uh, awesome on, on the screen to see. And then Battlestar. Exactly. <laughs> zombie Battlestar. Zombie, zombie Star Wars. Like, zombie Star Wars. Zombie Halo. Zombie. Zombie any. Slave Leia. Um, yeah. <laughs> It, it just kind of crank it up a notch. Like I really loved Zombieland and what they did with with zombies and that, and how they kind of just they took it to real world and then a little bit further. And I'm like, all right, well, what if we just you know that was a really small cast. What if we made it bigger? And what if we we kept the exact same business model where uh, instead of 100 percent of the net proceeds, we're doing at least 70 percent of the net proceeds are still going to charity. And what if people can donate to read the script early? And then they could donate to actually see the the you know audio from the table read put together with storyboards, and then they could donate to have their movie as or their name as like the celebrity in the Walk of Fame, um, and all of the monies then go into proceeds. I mean, it's I'm still not at the point yet where I feel confident and comfortable going. All right, I'm going to go to Hollywood and make a, a million dollars, but right. 
you know, I do feel confident going, all right, I'm going to take two weeks off of work and we're going to really do this right. Um, so that gives you guys an opportunity. If you guys want to be in a movie, come on out and, and help us out when we get started and, you know, have be extras and, and do podcasting and, and do all the other fun stuff. And if you want to be zombies, yes, let's do that. <laughs> that's right. So they die zombies. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I mean, that's, that's the other interesting thing is that I want to actually see this, this fake convention that we're creating with people like you. Um, if you supported Brown Coats Redemption, you know, why not have Sci-Fi Diner as a booth in there just to give you guys some visual advertising? Why not have you guys uh, have, like, posters that you see in the background promoting you? Because from a movie standard point of view, most people aren't going to realize these are people that we actually know. Right. But to, it breaks the fourth wall in the sense that this entire thing that's going on is wrapped around real things. So it kind of builds a little bit of credibility to the world that they're in. Hmm. Well, now, uh, so when are you, like... What sort of time frame are we looking at here? Um, we're looking, I'm aiming, fingers crossed, for a release at South by Southwest in 2013. Okay. Um, so we're pretty much getting ready to get started and get aggressive, just like we did with Redemption. Um, working on the script, that's about 98% done. I'm going to be throwing that around to a few people I know who are going to rip it up a shreds like zombies. And uh, <laughs> that do is we're going to put it out to the public and we haven't figured out what the donation is but you're going to make a donation and you're going to get a copy to read the script and it's going to be watermark to you so if you put it out on the internet we know who you are but <laughs> it, it's the opportunity for those people that want to get invested early like we did with Brown Coach Redemption to do the exact same thing like you can get early you can make notes your notes will be read and and you know anybody that was at the table read can say that you know, they could see where their influence kind of impacted some of the jokes in the movie. Um, we want the very much same thing. We want this to be extremely inclusive. We want it to be extremely community based, and we want this to be better, if if at all possible, than Brown Coats Redemption as far as what we can do for charity. Have you started casting it yet? Not yet. Okay. Um, we're probably not going to get started on that until maybe around March. Of next year, okay. Um, just because it's you know I made the promise that I need to take two weeks off. We're coming close to the edge of that two weeks, so um, you know, starting in October, we're going to really focus on building the business model a little bit more. We're going to be focusing on building the marketing plan because we're going to do some things that we weren't allowed to do. Pretty much like the chains come off because we have no legal constraints that we had before. Like we weren't allowed to do digital downloads, so you can digital download this movie. Um, we weren't allowed to do uh, like a director's cut of the movie, so there'll be that. There'll be um, diff multiple T-shirts, and, and if we can, action figures, which would be cool, um, where you can kind of really get invested. Because I think it would be kind of cool, personally, to own something that... And they're doing it today with uh, Big Bang Theory. Like, if you see them wearing a T-shirt that's made of a fictional, like the Lords of Ka'a or whatever it is, card game that they play, you can buy that shirt. Right. And we'd like to be able to do the same thing, but know that when you did that, your money goes to one of the charities we're supporting. Hmm. So That's awesome. That's awesome. And, you know, I think, uh, well, Mark did a lot of that type of merch merchandising, too. And yeah, it, how did that do, the, What was that? How did that do? I didn't, I, I heard about it, and then it kind of disappeared off my radar. Yeah, I think it did fairly well, uh, but I don't, I didn't, uh, we chatted with Chris, Chris Prexco, right? That was his mm -hmm. name, and... Uh, and we and uh, and it seemed to be doing well from what I was reading on Twitter. I didn't actually hear numbers though. Okay. Uh, so, but but I know that he had a huge merchandising campaign came with that. You know, a lot of yeah. mugs and you know action figures and video games you could play with it and all sorts of stuff you could do. But cool. but I I think that sounds awesome, Miles. I want to see you as a zombie. <laughs> I mean, after all, we killed you off in the last show. Yeah, so what that, did you, okay, what happened in the last show? I, I got to get caught up. No, that last show, My, Miles decided to wear a red shirt with a Star Trek emblem to the episode, and I kept threatening to kill him off all night. Yes, and that, that's all that happened in the last mm -hmm. show. We just, we just, uh, I keep, I kept threatening. Now he's wearing a black Star Trek shirt, so I can't really <laughs> kill him off. But, but that's what it is. But, but you see, if I kill him off, now he can come back as a zombie. It'll be all fine. 
Yeah, but you know, what kind of host would you have where it's constantly going, uh, and you're, you're trying not to get eaten? Brains. <laughs> It'd be kind of like that scene in, um, I don't think I'm giving any spoilers, uh, Shaun of the Dead, where they're, uh, Shaun is trying to play, you know, PlayStation with his friend, and his friend had just. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> 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 oh yeah, so it's uh the the beautiful thing about this is if I can keep the script intact without too many people uh making damaging notes to it and changing a lot of the course, which may happen. Uh-huh. Uh, there's there's some nice Shaun of the Dead references. There's a reference to like one of the characters shows up and he's unintentionally wearing a red t shirt. Uh, the zombie apocalypse starts happening inside, he immediately steals a, a black t shirt off a booth. Because he's like, you know what happens to the people in these shirts. And, <laughs> right. Yeah. Nice. So, I mean, it's, there's going to be references. Uh, the, the corporation that accidentally lets the virus out is called the Osiris Pharmaceutical Corporation. Um, of course, a reference to uh, Firefly, or at least a nod. Right, right. Uh, there, there's going to be tons of those, like little nods to home and, and everywhere. And, and I want to try fun. to... Get, what's that? That's it. That'll be fun. Yeah, That'll be and, and you're probably going to see some of the actors or extras from Broncos Redemption making appearances in the movie because, you know, it would just it, it wouldn't be right to do it without them. Right, right, right. Well, you, you'll definitely have to keep us in mind when you begin uh, doing con scenes for this. So, wouldn't mind, wouldn't mind. You know, we can set up a booth or something there. Do you have a Do you have any locations picked out yet? Uh, still working a lot of that out. We've got a, a gentleman who's interested in producing. Uh, we're more than welcome to, to have more producers on uh, and sponsors. And right about now, it's it's going to depend on how much it is. I'm going to try to keep it in the Maryland, PA, Delaware area because mm-hmm. uh, it, it can be kind of inexpensive to go that route. But then again, that doesn't mean, like, let's say Texas comes up and says, we really want to do the movie and we'll give you guys $25,000 to buy additional supplies. And I will go, okay, that just paid for hotel and airfare. I guess where we're going. <laughs> yep. Here we go. <laughs> Everybody take two weeks of vacation, and we're gone. <laughs> Very nice. Have, have you seen, wasn't there that Night of the Living Trekkies? Wasn't that a yeah. zombie thing? Mm-hmm. Did you ever uh, see? I, I know it's a book, and I know they did a really short teaser trailer. I think that's what I saw, I the teaser. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would have loved to see that as a movie. And I, like, I know that they've got, uh, like, I'm friends with the guys that do Ninjas vs. Vampires. Okay. And Ninjas vs. Zombies. Um, so, like, it's really funny seeing those guys. They're, they just finished and put out Ninjas vs. Vampires, which is the sequel to Ninjas vs. Zombies. Um, and they're working on uh, their third movie, Ninjas vs. Monsters. But it's interesting to see that Ninjas vs. thing and the Zombies vs. thing because I was at Comic Con and they were releasing Fanboys vs. Zombies. Oh, okay. Which, uh, which is a comic book that's essentially like four fanboys get caught in a convention and they're, they use the knowledge they've gotten from other zombie movies to fight the zombie apocalypse. And I'm like, um, I might want to read that to make sure that we're not doing the same thing. Right. And, and we're not, which is really nice because, um, and one of the characters has no idea what a zombie movie is cause he's lived a sheltered life. All the kids ages are ranging from like 12 to 13. So, you're not going to get like you know kids wailing on zombies all the way through because then you, it's just that just feels kind of creepy, right? Um, so it allows me to go in a completely different direction with it and, and make them run and hide and have to use the world around them and all the other cool stuff like that. Yeah. Well, that's how that's, that sounds. What, one of the things I was thinking about as you were mentioned as you were kind of describing it to us is we had a listener call in who was reading a book called Shat- Shatner Quake. Yes. Who are were Shatner's at his con and all his past characters come out of the woodwork and start chasing him through the con. Oh, I have to find that movie. Uh, it's, it's, it's not it's not a movie, Shatner. it's a book, right? It's a book. Yeah. It was a book. Mm-hmm. But I but you're just saying, you know, you're talking about the con setting and I think that, you know, there haven't been a lot of stuff happening at con settings like that. And so that kind of makes it a unique playing field and a fun playing field, especially if you're you're throwing out all the geek references and you have people dressed up as all these characters as you're saying and and that just makes a lot of fun. Yeah, it's was- uh Galaxy oh, Quest. Sorry, I'll just say Galaxy Quest kind of had a little fun with the whole convention thing, so that'll be fun to revisit that. And, and that's the idea, is to really kind of do what they did with Galaxy Quest, which is create a fake convention that looks like it almost would be cool enough to attend, and then just let kind of the chaos go. Right. Um, by the way, you can actually pick up Shatner Quake at Amazon for seven ninety five, and I think I'll be doing that right after this. <laughs> oh, cool! Yeah, I know. I'm not read it. I just heard about it. When did it? Does it say when it came out? Uh, let's see. Do, 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 details. 
No, that's shipping details. Um, no, it doesn't, which oh, sucks. That, oh, hold on. Wait a minute. Let me scroll down a little bit. April 2009. So that's not that old of a book. No, not at all. So Kindle. Um, do they have a Kindle version? Uh, See, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, they do. I could look this up, but I'm making you answer my questions, Mike. <laughs> no, that's right in front of me. That's fine. They do. I, I will be honest. Uh, I think I might even buy it used for four ninety five. Okay. Might as well. <laughs> Come on. So there's a, a movie actually coming out. Like zombies are coming back hardcore. Like the uh, Walking Dead. Of course, can't wait. Out. A- um, October sixteenth, baby. I'm excited. I saw Norman Reedus at Dragon Con. I was like, is it going to be better than the last season? He's like, oh yeah. Um, and Norman Reedus of the Boondock Saints kind of fame. Right. Um, so uh, talk to him. I talked to, and if this is cool, this would be awesome. One of the cinematographers for Walking Dead was there. Oh, cool. And I asked him if he'd be interested in working on our film. And he's like, absolutely. Oh, good. Um, you know, so that I just want to try to tie this as much back to uh, the zombies as we possibly can. If you work on something, then get involved. Um, but yeah, so kind of lost track. But there's a movie called uh, One of the Dead coming out of Cuba. Okay. <laughs> that is, uh, I'll send you guys the link for it, but it's. It's a zombie movie. It's basically instead of Shaun of the Dead, where it's the the wimpy kind of British character that ultimately becomes a hero. This guy creates, you know, one of the dead zombie you know, fighting services. So you could actually call him, and he'll charge you to come kill your zombies. But it's just interesting to see uh, Cuba do a version of uh, a horror movie. Oh my gosh, that's kind of awesome. Mm-hmm. I suppose it'll be subtitled. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, well, very cool. And well, zombies have gotten big in comic books too. Oh yeah, uh, we talked to Bria Grant a few months ago. Um, she was and on her and her Euro- brother Zane Gray. Mm-hmm. Our, 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 I've been producing their own comic books. A zombie Zane comic. Grant, I guess. And uh, so yeah, zombies are huge now. It's uh, you, know, you can't go wrong with zombies. Yeah, it's uh, and the the nice thing about for me is like yeah, zombies are hot, but I also really really get into a story. Right. Uh, so I, I kind of did some subversive like research and asked a friend of mine to ask her, all of her horror friend writers um, and authors, like, what are some of the common cliche douchey mistakes that you just never want to see in a zombie movie? You know, things like the party splitting up and trying to find food, or the uh, you know completely self aware black guy that knows he's the black guy and knows he's going to die but still dies anyway, um, and just crazy stuff like that. It's just. And, and try to make sure that none of that bad cliche stuff finds its way into my script. Right. Right. Have you ever listened to the uh, uh, patio drama uh, We're Alive? No. It's a podcast, We're Alive, and there are, they've done two seasons, and it's a zombie podcast. And it's, it's free. You get it on iTunes. It's very professionally done. Uh, they have, you know, it's not one person reading it. it. The guy's got the people behind it have actors doing it. It's with sound effects and everything. It's, it's very well done. Yeah. So what we're oh checking God. out. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Their their website's awesome. It starts with like a zombie notebook. Yeah, so you will have to check it out. But anyway, anything else that you want to say about Big Damn Films and uh, this future project, or anywhere at anywhere that people can go to find out more about it? Uh, yeah, I mean, you could go to uh, BigDamnFanFilms dot com. Uh, we're getting the new domain. We're actually changing the name of the company uh, to move away not move away from fan films, but try to make sure that. People know that we're doing original content, so the name will be Big Damn Films. Um, and you'll be able to go to bigdamnfilms.com and learn about everything that we're doing. If you want to get involved, if you want to donate and help out, uh, we may be starting a Kickstarter program. Who knows? Um, but outside of that, just just keep an eye out there, and we'll be updating the Brown Coats Movie Twitter and Facebook pages um, as soon as more information comes out so that we can keep those people engaged that want to keep up with what we're doing as well. Well, excellent, excellent. And uh, will we see you at uh, uh, Farpoint uh, next year? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> now, the question is, is, like, if I have my way, I'll be working and promoting the movie. Uh, if my wife has her way, I will be just a regular fanboy enjoying the, and everything. But uh, it, it's really fun because I know this year for Farpoint, she's already booked for a costume contest. Or not costume contest, but costume panel. Oh, oh, good. As, the, as doing the uh, costumes for our film, which is awesome. It's really nice to see um, Kelly and a bunch of the other people getting their dues and getting the ability to talk about what they learned. Oh, very good. Awesome. Well, we look forward to 
seeing you guys at Farpoint and uh, hanging out with you again. We had a lot of fun hanging out with you last year. Definitely, man. Definitely hope to see you guys at We're back. Well, we hope you enjoyed the interview with Mike and uh, news about him.